What, what an honor it is to be with you tonight in this week. And, uh, uh, and I can, 76 years, 76th year, uh, you can just sense the things that God has done in this place. I don't, I don't know if you have that, that feeling, but, it, uh, but I can just sense that God has moved in mighty and powerful ways. And that is actually my prayer for you this weekend as well during this time, that God would move in your life. And so, Mark, thank you for inviting me uh, to be here. Uh, I, uh, I'm excited. I've never been to Cannon Beach Conference Center. It's beautiful. This is my first year. Uh, and uh, I'm thankful to be, uh, to be with you. Uh, well, bef before I jump in, I wanted to introduce you to uh, my family uh, because they're an important part of, uh, of my life and uh, of me being here. So I think I have a picture uh, of my family. If we could get that up on the screen. There's my family, my wife, Brienne. Uh, she is right here, and we've been married next month. It will be 19 years. Uh, yeah, thank you. Whenever I tell people and introduce my wife, they, they always wonder how old was she when you got married, uh, and how did you end up with her, all right? So you can ask her that question. Um, my, my oldest is uh, all the way on the left, uh, Joseph. He's almost 15. Uh, my second oldest, who's actually taller, uh, is uh, Jack. Uh, he's 13. Uh, my daughter is 10. And uh, the one, uh, the, the little one is Bennett, and he's five. He'll be six uh, this, this summer, actually, in September. And um, I want to tell a story about Bennett, because Bennett was our surprise baby. Uh, we, we were done at three, uh, and then uh, God had other plans for us. I don't know if anyone had kids like that. That's why there's a five-year gap. We tried to get them all together so that they would be out of the house at the same time. Uh, <laughs> But, but then we had Bennett. And so I, ha I have to tell you a story about Bennett because my other kids, I can't tell stories from the stage anymore uh, because they hear about it and everyone goes and tells them. But Bennett, I still can. Uh, and so uh, B Bennett, uh, uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago, uh, my daughter had this hamster. Uh, and uh, it's just this r really cute hamster, teddy bear hamster. And she, she named him Mimi. And, and Bennett loved Mimi. I mean, he loved playing with this hamster. And so he would often go to Sophia's room, and, uh, and this is when he was like three. He would get the stool that he used to brush his teeth out of the bathroom, bring it to her room, take off the cage, uh, and, uh, and he would take out the hamster, uh, and he would play with the hamster. And so many times uh, he lost the hamster, and so we had to find, uh, we had to find Mimi. And um, uh, I could tell several stories about this hamster because one time, you'll have to ask me about it, but I had to get the hamster out of the gutter on the second story of our house. So it's a, that's a long story. Mimi had an incredibly adventurous life. Uh, and uh, so, so, so Bennett gets uh, the hamster out of the cage and, uh, and, and then he comes downstairs uh, and my wife, uh, this is an important part of the story. My wife is not home. She's uh, at a women's Bible study. She leads the women's ministry at our church. And so she's not home. And Bennett comes downstairs uh, and, and he says, I can't find Mimi. Uh, and so, you, you know, this kind of routine, you know, wh where did you last have her? And he, and he said this. He said, I gave Mimi a bath. And I, said, <laughs> I said, okay, well, hamsters don't take baths. All right. Uh, and, it's, and I said, where did you give Mimi a a bath, and so he, he goes into our bedroom, and he goes into our master bathroom, and he walks around the corner, and he points to the toilet. I know, and my heart just sinks, and uh, be, because I, I I know the end of the story, right? It, just like you all, oh, you you like you know the end of the story, and. So we look over through the whole house for this hamster, and, and all along I'm thinking we're not going to find her. Uh, and my daughter is in tears, and she is bawling and crying, and my wife's gone. I know I'm going to get in trouble for it, even though Bennett gave her the bath and the toilet. And uh, so we look for like an hour, and uh, we, we, I, put, I put the kids to bed, the younger kids to bed. Uh, and, uh, and, and I, I put Ben to bed and then I decide to go to bed early is about nine o'clock and, and I lay in bed and, uh, and my wife's still gone. And I'm, uh, I, I put down my book and I turn off my lamp and I kind of, you know, get into my sleep zone and, and I feel something in my leg. 
And I threw the covers off. I think I yelled. I, our neighbors probably heard, heard me. And there is Mimi uh, snuggling with my leg. Uh, and, uh, but, but the good thing is she was okay. All right, she, she lived to see another day. She didn't have many days after that, but she lived another day. That is what life is like in my household with our youngest son. He is, he is just kind of the life and he brings joy and, and, and happiness to, to our family. I love all my kids. I mean, they're all great, but, but Bennett, uh, he just kind of brings that. And so you're going to hear me probably talk about him a little bit over the, the next uh, few, uh, the few days. And, uh, and, I, and I'm just, I, I'm, I'm excited to be here and, and to share with you. And uh, this weekend, I, I, I want to share in, in one of the best chapters of the Bible, I want to share out of Romans chapter 8. And so for the next three or four days, we're going to be in one chapter of the Bible, Romans chapter 8. And uh, I took my church through this um, a, a few months ago. And, and this, is, this is what I noticed. I, I, I noticed that, that for many of us, we just came through the hardest year of our life. Can anybody identify with that? All right. You, by the way, I'm an interactive preacher, so you can raise your hand. You can shout amen, all right? You can laugh. Uh, you can't call me names, but you can, you can clap or, or, or whatever. So, uh, so I noticed that, that a lot of people in my church had, uh, had been through the hardest year of their life. And uh, for me personally, it's been the hardest year in leadership. And many of my friends who are in ministry, uh, and many of you, like it, it's been the toughest year. And, and I thought, what better antidote to the hardest year we've ever experienced than to bring the best scripture that there is in the Bible? R Romans 8 is considered by many people to be the greatest chapter of the Bible. Did you know that? The greatest chapter in the greatest letter, which is Romans, in the greatest book, which is the Bible. Now, I know what a few of you are thinking. You're thinking, is there really a greater chapter of the Bible, right? It isn't all scripture inspired by God. 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired by God. All is written by God. All right, somebody say amen. amen. All right, that's what we believe. Uh, and so let, let me just share, share two things. The, the, the first thing is this, that, that all scripture is inspired by God, but, but all scripture is not as inspiring for your life as some are. Are you with me? Uh, and I'll illustrate it this way. If you called me and, and you had eight minutes to let live and you said, Pastor, I want you to come and I want you to read a chapter of the Bible. And I said to you, would you rather me ro read Romans 8 or Leviticus 8? All right. What would you say? Romans chapter 8. And so I want to talk about the greatest chapter. In the greatest letter, in the, in, in the greatest book, which is the Bible. And so we're going to take this in six messages. I have six messages, verse by verse. We're, we're going to take this. And I, uh, the, the second reason, the first reason I chose Romans 8 because of the hardest year people have had. I want to pair it with the best that, uh, some of the best scripture uh, and most powerful scripture that there is. But, but the other reason is this, is that I've realized that Romans 8 is for everyone. And, and we're going to be on this journey together, but Romans, Romans 8 is for, for everyone. Ro Romans 8 is for anyone who struggles with guilt or shame in their life. R Romans 8 is for anyone who struggles with a pattern in their life that they want God to help them break. Maybe an addiction or uh, a, a negative behavior or, or habit. Romans 8 is, is for anyone experiencing suffering and losses and grief in their, in their life. Romans 8 is for anyone who struggles with their identity, who they are in Jesus Christ. R Romans 8 is, is for anyone who, who might think, am I really saved? Right? It, 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 am I really in the kingdom of God? Am I really going to heaven when I die? R Romans 8 is for those who feel like maybe they're, they're losing ground in life, not gaining ground. Romans 8 is for you. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. I want to read the first four verses, and then I want to jump into this. Romans 8, 1 through for. Therefore, there is now no condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. And God, I pray, not only for tonight, but this entire weekend, that your word would be elevated and preached. Father, I pray that whatever flows from my mouth comes from you, God, and that you would speak to your people. That you would encourage us, you would inspire us, you would change us, and you would transform us. We love your word. We love you. In your name, and everyone said... Amen. What I want to do tonight is I want to talk about three words in Romans chapter 1. Th- three words I want to talk about. I want to talk about therefore, I want to talk about now, and I want to talk about condemnation. Therefore, now, and condemnation. And by the way, if you have notes, there are some notes so you can follow along with me. Therefore, w- whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you've got to ask what it's there for, right? Bible study 101. Therefore, is a conjunction that takes something that has already been said and brings it into the present. And and, and therefore, uh, causes us to look at the, the whole book of Romans and understand what Paul is trying to connect to this idea that therefore there is now no condemnation. And so, therefore, is connecting chapter 7, Romans chapter Seven In Romans chapter 7, I want to give you a brief overview of it. Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about freedom from the tyranny of the law. The Old Testament law that, that actually brought more awareness to sin and did the opposite of what it was intended to do. It was intended to free people from sinful pattern and behavior, but often it gave more awareness to it. Paul says in in Romans chapter 7 that sometimes I do what I don't want to do and sometimes I don't do what I want to do. You've heard that that verse. It's Romans chapter 7. And he's pulling Romans chapter 7 into Romans chapter 8. But not only that, that this therefore not only connects Romans chapter 7, but it it connects Romans chapter 6. Which talks about that we are no longer slaves to sin. But we are dead to sin, alive in Christ, and slaves to righteousness. Not only is this therefore pulling chapter 6, but it's also pulling chapter 5. Chapter 5 talks about being justified by faith, that we have peace with God. And in, in, in justification in Romans is such a big and important word. And the way I like to tell people and remind them what it means is, is you can remember it this way. That justification uh, can mean this. Just as if I've never sinned. That, that's justification. That God has acquitted you uh, and, and made you righteous and he's justified you. I mean it's, it's glorious scripture in chapter 5. But not only does this therefore connect chapter 5, it connects chapter 4. Chapter 4 where Abraham talks about righteousness and that it's not by works. And it also connects chapter 3. And many of you, I don't know if you you go to church a lot or not, but whenever someone talks about Romans, they skip two chapters of Romans. Chapter 2 and chapter 3. All right, because chapter two and chapter three are not the, the most encouraging parts of the, 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 the book of Romans. But chapter three, Paul says this, that no one is righteous, not one. All right, I, I wrestle with that for a little bit as you're reading this book, that no one is righteous. Chapter two says that all will be judged. And because of stubbornness and unrepented heart, God's wrath is going to come. But not only is it connecting chapter 2, but it's also connecting chapter 1. Where it says, since the creation of the world, the invisible qualities of God have been clearly seen. Therefore, men and women are without, anybody know, excuse. 
This therefore is perhaps the most important therefore in the book of Romans. And Paul is bringing everything he's already said into this this chapter that is just loaded with truth and encouragement about who God is. Therefore, the second word is now. Did you know that now can mean different things? We don't often think about language in this way, but now can mean Different things, and this now can actually mean different things. It could mean immediately now, or it can mean finally now. Do you, do you know that there's a difference? Let, let, let me explain it with my kids. If one of my kids is not doing what I've asked them to do, or maybe one hits the other one, all right, that sometimes happens in my household, um, I might say, go to your room now. And that now means like immediately. Right? Like, went now, right? Don't, don't delay. Go to your room now, immediately now. The, the, other, the other way that, that this could mean is, is finally now. Um, th- this summer, uh, my, my family are, we're taking, I'm taking a sabbatical from ministry, three months off. And so this is actually my last time uh, preaching until three months off. And so we've been kind of planning this for several months and excited for it. We're going to do some trips and We're going to just do some things that we've never been able to do as a family. And so we've got a vacation plan that my kids are excited about. And and on on June 10th, we're going to wake up and we're going to get on a plane and we're going to fly to Chicago to see our family. All of our family lives in Chicago. We haven't seen them for three years. And uh, and, in COVID, you're right, we just made it even harder. And so we're going to jump on the the plane on June 10th. And I'm going to call up to... My kids, they're, all their rooms are upstairs. I'm just going to say, it is time to leave now. Which means finally, the thing that we've been waiting for and talking about is now ready to happen. Finally now. So which one is it? Yes. Both. That finally, we, we've been, if I could... If I could just read Romans to you, I wish I could. But finally, what, what we've been reading in, in Romans, not, but not only that, finally what, what Christians and in, 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 in the people in Rome have been waiting to hear. Did you know that, that Paul is writing to a group of people, uh, uh, he's writing to Jews and he's writing to Greeks. He, he's, he's writing to Jews who've had this Jewish religion for, for millennium, and they've kind of carried this tradition into Christianity, and he tries to break some of that. And then you have these Greeks who've just worshipped uh, 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 several gods, and they've come into the kingdom of God, and he's preaching to both. And for the Jews, it's finally now. There is no condemnation. F- finally, and for the Greeks, where the Jews have tried to overlay some of their own religiosity on top of them and Paul corrects it and for them it's finally now finally now but not not only finally immediately now like like right now there is no condemnation are you with me N- now there is no condemnation in the present right now and the last word is where I want to take most of my time on tonight and it's the word Condemnation. Condemnation. What does condemnation mean? Condemnation means this, to be considered guilty and subjected to punishment. It's not a fun word. To be condemned is is twofold, to be guilty and subject to punishment. And I want to talk about guilt. I want to zero in on this idea of, of guilt because the reality is, is that Everyone who's ever lived and has a, a pulse hates guilt, all right? And, and, and the reality is we've all experienced guilt, yeah? All right, and, and if you've never experienced guilt, then, then you should feel guilty about not ever feeling guilty, all right? We, we, we've all experienced guilt, and, and we hate the feeling of guilt, and guilt is that that feeling that you've, you've done something wrong, it's, it's, it's internal. It's kind of between you and, and God. It's in, it's in your mind. It's in your conscience. It's, it's, it's in your thinking, and it is, it is very personal. 
And, and, and we don't like that feeling of, of guilt. And it is, it is very private. And, and a lot of people get confused between guilt and, and shame. All right, you, you, you know the difference between guilt and shame. I'll explain it this way. Guilt is the feeling that you did something wrong. Shame is the feeling that you are something wrong. Guilt is this very private feeling that you have between uh, the world around you or, or, or God. Uh, sh- shame is, is very public. Shame is the feeling uh, that, 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 that you aren't right. And the, and the feeling that, that people have put on you that something is wrong with you. We don't like either, but... But I want to talk about guilt. I want to focus on guilt. We, we don't like guilt. It, and the secular Western world has a solution for guilt. Because it's not just those who call themselves, themselves Christians who don't like guilt. It is everyone who's ever lived who doesn't like guilt. And the secular Western world has a solution for guilt. And the solution is... To get rid of God. And if we can. According to the western culture. If we can get rid of God. Then we can get rid of the feeling of being guilty. And and you can can see. I mean if you take an overarching view. And kind of step back and look at Christianity and faith in, in in our country. You see this diminishing Of the awareness of God. And part of this is is due to a 19th century German philosopher. Who actually really was was one of the primary thinkers in in this idea that that God is is dead. Actually it's it's his language. Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philosopher. His argument is this. And his argument, by the way, is being lived out today in the world around us. But his argument is this, that that if we can get rid of God, if if there is no God, then there is no sin, right? The, The idea that there are things that are right and wrong. If there is no God, then there is no sin. If there is no sin, then there is no guilt. And he says this, that guilt is a primitive lingering idea from religion. And so that's his God is dead. He tried to erase God from culture. It's interesting because I read an article recently uh, called The Strange Persistence of Guilt. It's written in the Hedgehog Review by a, a man named Wilfred McClay. It, it, and he said this, he he, and he isn't a Christian, all right, but, but, but he talks about this idea of guilt. And, and he says, and he calls, the, the title of it is The Strange Persistence of Guilt. It's strange be, because with the elimination of God, guilt was supposed to decrease. But, but, but what he said in his research and in, in, in the people he's talked to is that not only has it not decreased, it's actually the feeling of guilt has increased as people have eliminated God from their life. So the the feelings of guilt actually increase as God disappears from your thinking or from our thinking. Now the disappearance of God in our culture, I think, is about not wanting to feel guilty. And I, I know this. I know, I know, a lot of people might think, well, I actually know people like this, that, that if I can't get rid of God, then I'm going to get rid of a just God. I, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. Uh, I pastor this church in Newburgh. It's, I, I love our church, filled with a bunch of young people and people eager to, 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 to just to be pastors. And there was this young man who... Uh, was training, as he's in Bible college, training to be a, a pastor and wanted to be a youth pastor. He was helping out with our, with our kids and our, our students. And, um, and, and I found out that he had a, a, a different idea theologically than what our church agreed with. And so I, I invited him to my office and I sat him down and I, and I asked him this. 
Because it, this was like a something to divide for type issue, all right? It wasn't something like, hey, let's just all get along. I mean, it went against one of the core tenets of what we believe as a church. And I invited him in to my office, and we began to talk about it. And, uh, and I opened up the scriptures, right? It's where I go first. I opened up the scriptures and showed him the scriptures. And I said, I want you to show me, can you show me how you came to this conclusion through the scriptures? And he says, well, well, I didn't. He, he said, I didn't come to this conclusion theologically. I came to it philosophically. God is love. And God would want his people to be happy. To say the least, things did not work out for him in our church. <laughs> but his attempt and to not make people feel guilty was to eliminate the idea of a just God, a holy God, a, a righteous God. And with the elimination of guilt and the elimination of a just God, do you know that the philosophy of our culture has a gospel? Do you know culture has a gospel? And I'll tell you what it is. The gospel is this, of, of our culture. You're not bad. You shouldn't feel ashamed. You shouldn't feel guilt. Do what you want to do because you can do no wrong. Be who you want to be. Free yourself from the shackles of morality. In the words of Jason Mraz, the pop singer, you do you and I'll do me. And then there's Romans. Romans 121 says, says that, that, that they knew God, but they didn't glorify him as God. It's interesting, when I read the book of Romans, I, I think, Paul, are you writing to us in the 21st century? In a, even a, I don't want to say post-COVID, but I'll just prophetically say that, in a post-COVID culture, in talking about people futile in their thinking, and it, and it says this in, in verse 28 of chapter 1, it says that God gave them over to a depraved mind. I want to give you four things that, that I'm, I'm, I will say the four things that are the problems with eliminating God from your life or erasing God. And they're, they're in your notes and so you can follow along. The, the first one is this. The cost to eliminating God from your life is emptiness. And so if people eliminate God from their life, they often replace feelings of guilt with feelings of, of emptiness, of, of despair. And, and when you... Uh, have feelings of emptiness, then, then you're, this idea of God's destiny and identity in your life go with it, and his, and his purpose in your life go with it. So the cost to eliminating God from life is emptiness. The, the second one is this. There is an innate desire in humans to be right with the world. Everyone, there, there, there is an innate desire to be right with the world. I think this goes back to Romans 1.20 where it says that the invisible qualities of God are seen throughout creation and we are without excuse. And there, there is this feeling inside, I think, of everyone to be right with, with the world. And, and I think the way that Western world copes with this desire is moral activism. And so a new religion is actually birthed. One that is predicated upon doing the right things instead of being the right kind of people. The, the third thing I would say is this, is that the world has a way of regulating guilt and its own version of morality. You realize that, right? That the world has a way of regulating its own guilt and regulating its own version of what is right and wrong. As much as people say, what's right for you is right for you, what's right for me is right for me, all you got to do is go on social media and realize that's not true. All you got to do is go on Facebook and realize that that is not true. And the way that the world regulates guilt and, and morality is public shaming. It's public shaming. I'll just give you a couple examples that we've seen in, in recent times. The first one is body shaming, right? We, that, that many people are, are they're, they're, they're shamed in their bodies and the way they look based on what they see and what gets uh, out there on social media, culture, whatever it is. 
The, the second way is, uh, or another way, I could, I could go on and on, but I, I won't for the sake of our time tonight, but it's mommy shaming, all right? Mommy shaming. Uh, moms, if you want to feel really bad about yourself, go read mom blogs, all right? You, you know what I'm talking about? You, you don't, all right? Someone does. All right, thank you, Audra. You know the, the, the mom who has like 18 kids and her house is in perfect order? And her, and her kids are all obedient, right? They don't pull hamsters out of cage and wash them in the toilet, all right? And, and, and then they're, they're following pioneer woman recipes every night. And their pictures are beautiful and their backgrounds of their house look magnificent, right? There, there's lots of ways that the world makes us feel bad about ourselves, but one way is public shaming. And the, the, the center of public shaming today is, is in social media. That's, that's the center of it. The fourth thing is this, the problem with raising God, is guilt doesn't really disappear. Guilt doesn't really disappear. Why is that? Romans 2.15 says this, that the requirements of the law have written on our hearts. Because we are created in God's image, Genesis chapter 1, 26, in the image of God, he created us, male and female, he created us. Because we're created in God's image, we are created with the desire to be right with our creator. And God's laws and his truth are written on our heart. They're stamped on our heart. And at the end of the day, we all make mistakes. All of us cause pain. All of us hurt one another. We all end up breaking some promises. And all of that leads to a guilty conscience. You can eliminate God from your life, but deep down we know that there is something wrong with us. With the elimination of God, not only does guilt disappear, but it gets worse. And without a just God, without a holy God, without a Savior who died on the cross that eliminated our sin, there's no atonement. There's, there's no place to relieve us of that guilt. So I want to tell you, and I want to close today, with the gospel according to Romans 8. The gospel according to Romans 8. You know what gospel means, right? Gospel means what? Good news. For there to be good news, there's got to be what? Bad news. Otherwise, news is just news. It's neutral. We don't like to talk about the bad news, all right? I just talked about the bad news. And whenever I do, it gets real quiet. But it's important to talk about the bad news if we're going to talk about the Good news. And the, and, the, and the bad news is this. And, and if, if you re read Romans 1, 2, and 3, just, just read it tonight or this weekend. And, and you realize that Paul is actually making a case for this. That, that we feel guilty because we are guilty. That no one is righteous. Not, not even one. And so he's... He's bringing us to this point of therefore there is now no condemnation by, by pointing out the fact that there really is bad news. And the guilty consciences are there because we, we are guilty. That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That the sin of Adam and Eve was passed down through the generations. And it still lives in us and we're slaves to it. But Paul points out the good news. And the good news, verse 2, that we have no condemnation because we are set free from the law of sin and death. How are we set free? Verse 3 says that God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And Jesus condemned Sin on the cross, same word as condemnation. He condemned sin on the cross once and for all so we could experience righteousness. P people call this 
the interchange. Theo, theologians and scholars call this the interchange. I, in your notes, I call it the great exchange. And, and here it is, that, that the, the gospel according to Romans chapter 8. Here it is. Here's the punchline. Christ became what we are so we could become what he is. That, that, that Jesus became in the likeness of sinful humanity, bore the weight of sin on the cross. He became what we are so that we could have what he has. And in that moment and in that decision to walk with Jesus and follow Jesus and be with Jesus, it is in that that therefore there is now no condemnation. Only in that moment, in that personal relationship with Jesus is there no condemnation. Jesus became human. He experienced temptation and he took our sins and punished our sins on the cross. He became the sacrifice for us so that we could be righteous. The one thing that we all long for to be right with God and right with the world, we receive that in Christ. A, a little later this weekend, I'm going to talk more about righteousness. But, but, but do you know that when you are justified and you receive the righteousness of God, when God looks at you, he does not see your past. He does not see your negative patterns. When you are in Christ, he sees the righteousness of Jesus overlaid upon you. He sees Jesus in you. That's the good news. That he became what we are so we could become what he is. I want to close in a, a prayer. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? And in a moment, we're going to finish with the song and the band's going to come up. But as I was thinking about this, I, I realized this, that, that everyone has a therefore in their life. Everyone has a therefore. And therefore is, is a past. And your future is predicated on your past. And your, your future will follow the same thing as your past unless there's a life-altering event that happens in the middle. Everyone has a therefore. Everyone has a now. And a now is a decision in the present to make based on all your past experiences all the pain and all the mistakes. Everyone has a now. And this now is, is a kairos moment. You know, in the Bible, there are two different words for the word time. And it's chronos and kairos. And chronos is chronological time. It's time that is measured in minutes. But kairos is God's time. It's moment in time. It's time that is measured in moments, and for some of you, maybe tonight is a Kairos moment, a moment where you receive Jesus for the first time or receive him again or renew your relationship with him, and you receive his righteousness. And everyone can have no condemnation. I say everyone can have because Paul is very clear. That there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And in that moment and in that relationship, we have no condemnation. Maybe some of you are here this weekend and you walked in with a profound sense of guilt. I believe God wants to take that from you. And when we give that to God, he takes that upon his shoulder and he gives you his Holy Spirit. And maybe even some of you right now in this moment, you're feeling that and you want his justification and righteousness. And I would encourage you to ask him for it and give your life back to him and give your guilt back to him and let him wash you anew once again. God, we love you so much. We thank you for your words. We thank you for your gospel. We thank you for your good news. Jesus, I pray 
that this weekend would be an incredible time for us to fall deeper in love with you and know our sense of identity in who you've called us to be. We love you, Lord, and we praise your name. Amen.